Welcome back. Shirley Eustis Place in Roxbury is one of the last remaining colonial governor's mansions in the original 13 colonies, named after the two governors who lived there, William Shirley and William Eustis. But it's believed to have had an additional hidden history. Research suggests that the property was built and managed by enslaved people, which would make it one of only two still standing slave quarters in the Northeastern United States. This August, it was officially designated as a Boston landmark. And joining us now is Reverend Mariama White Hammond, Chief of Environment, Energy and Open Spaces that oversees the Boston Landmarks Commission. Thank you for being here with us, Reverend Hammond. It's good to be here. So we're, we call it uh, Shirley Eustis place. Mm -hmm. uh, the estate is comprised of three buildings. Explain why they're historically and architecturally significant. So you have the main house that many people have seen and that is um, where the families lived. Um, it's a mansion and uh, when you see it, it automatically has that historical character. Um, but we also have um, a, a carriage house to the side, which is actually moved to the property, mm -hmm. um, but which were stables. And then um, there's also a house up the street that honestly, when I was growing up, was not taken note of. Mm -hmm. But the oral history in the neighborhood um, called attention to the fact that that house was once a barn. Um, it's been, you know, re re uh, stored and renovated and now it's a mm -hmm. home, but it mm -hmm. was a barn. And um, our understanding is that that is where enslaved peoples lived and slept in addition um, to spending time in the house. So when did researchers uh, start finding out evidence that the outbuilding had housed in enslaved people? And, and what prompted the research? Yeah, so there's a few different um, documents. So a number of the uh, particularly children who mm -hmm. lived in the house. We know that um, there was a young man named Jack who was 13. He'd been stole multiple times and um, it appears that he ran away. Mm -hmm. um, also a little girl, baby Jane, um, who was baptized. She was baptized at King's Chapel in April of 1746. So there were lots of different um, documents that came together to, to begin to name and um, pay attention to the folks who live there, but there also was the oral history in that neighborhood. I grew mm -hmm. up in Roxbury, mm -hmm. and there were folks there who had spent the time to do research that talked to folks who had lived there mm -hmm. over the years, um, and so it, I was able to talk to some of the neighbors who held those stories mm -hmm. until um, a student came along and documented them and worked with uh, the uh, folks who uh, oversee the house and then put in a petition to the Landmarks Commission for us us to um, really celebrate and lift up those folks, lift up their names. Sure, because it's often rare to find documents um, that can specifically uh, trace the name mm -hmm. of an enslaved person. Unfortunately, they were listed as property, mm. and that is how we know. We know about Thomas Scipio, who, uh, when the Hutchinsons were living in the house in the Battle of 1776, Lexington and Concord, because they were tied to the crown, mm -hmm. when that battle happened, mm -hmm. they got a little concerned about their status. They left the house, and Thomas, mm -hmm. an enslaved person, watched over the house, kept it, um, and, and uh, preserved it while the family had run away. And so these are the stories. Um, you, you have to look in the documents and look in, unfortunately, the property manifest, but um, we're really thankful to have found some of the names. We wanna make sure that they're in the official record. Um, share with us, if you will, a little bit more of the oral history. It sounds like a, a fascinating uh, a passing down of knowledge. Yeah, it was fascinating. So I, the, uh, one of the neighbors that I met with, um, you know, she talked about, her grandmother had having shared some of the stories with her, mm -hmm. her making sure that other young people um, got to meet with some of the folks from um, the Dudley Street Neighborhood uh, Association and they had also um, uh, lifted some of those stories up in some of the uh, community meetings and neighborhood spaces. So we, we're just thankful to be able to make sure that they make it into the official record. And what we're hoping is that this stimulates even more research mm -hmm. um, that 
some more students, maybe some graduate students or undergraduate students um, would get excited and spend time um, digging because we think there's even more to be found. Speaks to the very strong oral tradition in the African American that is community. Very true. That served, uh, uh, served us very well in this project. So the Shirley Eustis House was already a National Historic Landmark. Mm -hmm. Tell us why it was important to designate the property as a city landmark. Yes. So the National uh, Register is really important. It, it allows folks to pay attention. It catches the attention of researchers, et cetera. But in terms of making sure that a building is actually saved from uh, demolition and is protected, um, it is, it is pretty important for it to be designated as a landmark through um, the Boston process. Mm -hmm. And we hope that more folks will enter into that process. It's, it's, it's not too hard. You have to find 10 registered voters who come together and say, we think this is a, a space that should be um, acknowledged and protected. Um, and then we have a process in which we bring some folks together to study the space, looking at its architect architectural significance, as well as its historical significance. Um, and then it gets voted on by the Landmark Commission and then both the city council and the mayor each have 15 days to approve that. So we were really thankful. Uh, with Shirley Eustis, it moved significantly faster um, because everyone acknowledged the importance. Right now we're looking at some uh, video of the archaeological dig on the site of the mm -hmm. building's original foundation. What were some of the items that the researchers uh, found? Uh, it looks like a, a, a hair pick <laughs> looks like something that I might even use today. And are the artifacts uh, available for public viewing? So uh, I'll say a couple things. So many of the older artifacts we had hoped to find, we did not find. And that's in part because the site has been used quite a bit over the years. And so we there were some sites found, but <laughs> there was even a styrofoam lid found. Oh, my goodness. So there was a mix of, <laughs> of things across the centuries. Uh, one of the things I think is really exciting about the archaeology department is a lot of the things that have been dug up, including at the Malcolm X house, mm -hmm. and are, are being cataloged and put online. So we're mm. really looking forward. Um, we're, we're actually looking forward also to an exhibit to, that will come to Faneuil Hall. Mm -hmm. um, there also was evidence of enslaved peoples in Faneuil Hall that we want people to be able to see and interact with, not touch, because it's pretty yes, old, right. but we want um, So people will be able to, be to see able. them online, yes. and people can do their own research, exactly. uh, and even if they're just inquisitive about what was found there. Yes, there's a lot Thank of you. amateur historians out there sure are. Um, that are willing to dig. I've even tried to do that a bit in my own family's history. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we want, there's a story told about Boston. It's important that we know about Paul Revere and we know about John Adams and all of those, those folks. But, but it's these people also are a important. part of history too. Yes, That's and right. they, their names have often been forgotten. Yes. Their stories have not told. Thank and, you for bringing these stories to us. Doing and our thank best. thank you for all the work that you're doing, Reverend Mariama White Hammond. Uh, coming up on City Line, we're gonna travel across New England to find more houses with history. We visit the Berkshires, home of one of half of the brotherly duo credited with composing the Black National Anthem.